Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're all continuing to enjoy the Easter break. And I know that over this weekend, millions of people have been able to see loved ones for the first time in months. And I want to thank you all again for your patience, because it is really clear now that this is paying off. And it's your collective efforts, our collective efforts, that have given us the crucial time and space to vaccinate more than 31 million people. And I'm pleased we've also been able to support our overseas territories so that Gibraltar has become the first place in the world, one of the first places in the world, to offer a vaccination to its entire adult population. And the net result of your efforts, and of course with the, of the vaccine rollout, is that I can today confirm that from Monday the 12th of April we will move to step two of our roadmap reopening shops, gyms, zoos, holiday campsites, personal care services like hairdressers, and of course, beer gardens and outdoor hospitality of all kinds. And on Monday the 12th, I will be going to the pub myself and cautiously but irreversibly raising a pint of beer to my lips. We're also increasing the number of visitors to care homes from one to two to allow residents to see more of their loved ones. We think that these changes are fully justified by the data, which show that we're meeting our four tests for easing the lockdown, as Chris will shortly explain. But, and you know I'm going to say this, we can't be complacent. We can see the waves of sickness afflicting other countries, and we've seen how this story goes. We still don't know how strong the vaccine shield will be when cases begin to rise, as I'm afraid that they will. And that's why we're saying, please get your vaccine or your second dose when your turn comes. And please use the free NHS tests, even if you don't feel ill. Because remember, one in three people with this virus doesn't have any symptoms. And you can get these tests from your pharmacies, from pharmacies or uh, your local test site. You can even order them on gov.uk and get home deliveries. As part of our roadmap, we're also publishing today on gov.uk the early thinking on our four reviews on the safe return of major events, on social distancing, the potential role of COVID status certification and on the resumption of international travel. We set out our roadmap and we're sticking in it. And I want to stress that we see nothing in the present data that makes us think that we will have to deviate from that roadmap. But it's by being cautious, by monitoring the data at every stage, and by following the rules, remembering hands, face, space, fresh air, that we hope together to make this roadmap to freedom irreversible. Thank you very much. I'm now going to go to Chris for the slides. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. First slide, please. Uh, the uh, government set out four tests, and these just uh, lay out some data, uh, some of the data that lie behind uh, the decision that, th that the tests had been met. Uh, the first test was that the vaccine deployment uh, programme continues successfully. Uh, and I think, as everyone has seen over the last uh, weeks, uh, the vaccines are being rolled out by the NHS at a remarkable rate, uh, continuing uh, to, to do so. Um, uh, over uh, 31 million uh, individuals have had their first dose, and we're now in the situation where people at the highest risk are now beginning to get their second dose, and uh, there are over 5.4 uh, million people have received uh, a second dose, so a first dose in uh, around 60% of the adult population at this point in time. So at this stage, uh, that is heading uh, very much in the right direction. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second uh, question uh, was whether there is evidence uh, that vaccines are sufficient uh, in, to actually reduce hospitalizations and deaths in people vaccinated. Uh, we had the original clinical trials, all of which were very reassuring, both for the vaccines we currently have and indeed for vaccines we might get later in the year. Uh, but you have to see how things work in practice. 
uh, and looking at the uh, data from people who've been vaccinated in uh, the four nations of the United Kingdom, uh, consistently we found a significant reduction uh, in people who have symptomatic disease, estimated at around 60%, give or take, uh, uh, and for people having hospitalisation, so more severe disease, uh, around an 80% reduction from the first dose. Uh, that makes two points. Firstly, these vaccines are highly effective, but secondly, they're not completely effective, and it is absolutely essential that everybody, as the Prime Minister has said, who is called for a second booster dose uh, goes to take that offer up because it will increase the level of protection and almost certainly increase the duration of protection as well. Next slide, please. The third test was that infection rates do not risk a surge in hospitalizations which would put unsustainable pressure on the NHS. And here you can see the number of people in hospital uh, with COVID-19 in the UK. And these have been falling uh, steadily now from the peak and they are continuing to fall, uh, which is really excellent news because obviously uh, hospitalizations then translate into people with long-term problems and, uh, and deaths. Uh, and alongside this, the number of people who are dying has also been steadily decreasing and at a faster rate than happened in the first peak. And that may well be because of a combination of the lockdown measures that everybody in the country has been uh, involved in and done such a remarkable job on, plus the effects of the vaccines on top of that, which led to an even faster reduction in mortality. And the average number of deaths uh, at the moment is running at around 47 deaths a day. It's been uh, lower numbers reported over the uh, Easter weekend, uh, unsurprisingly, but 47 a day on average. That's down from a uh, peak of around 1,300 uh, earlier in the year. Next slide, please. And the final test is our assessment of the risks not being fundamentally changed by new variants of concern. And throughout this, right from the beginning, we've said we do expect there to be variants of concern along the way, and some of those may potentially be ones that are uh, more able to escape the vaccine. So this is, a, this is going to be a continuing issue. But if you look at the numbers uh, here in the UK, um, of the ones, and we have a very good testing capacity in the UK, so some of the best uh, in the world at the moment. Uh, and so uh, we have a high, a high, de high degree of confidence uh, in our capacity to test for variants. If you look at the top line with the B117 variant, which is the dominant variant uh, in uh, the UK at the moment, uh, uh, over 170,000 uh, confirmed cases uh, the next one down, South African variant, uh, B1351, uh, first described in South Africa, may obviously have come from somewhere else. Uh, the total number genomically confirmed there is a much smaller number, uh, 469. Uh, and that proportion has stayed steady over time. So there is no evidence that this is increasing. We are, however, picking up more cases uh, because of testing at borders. So as people come in, people are tested uh, and some people are found to have variants. And then much smaller numbers again uh, for two of the other con uh, variants that we're concerned about. One uh, that was first described from Brazil and one of which uh, was first described here uh, in England. So um, at the moment, the re although variants of concern will remain an issue, there is no reason to see, feel that this fundamentally changes our, our position. We've always known that this was a risk. So those are the four tests. And there's, of course, a lot of other data, but these are just a snapshot of some of the data we have uh, to support the government's feeling that these tests have been met. Thanks very much, Chris. Patrick, anything to, to add to that? Thanks very much. Let's go straight to Catherine from Basingstoke. When will residents of care homes, many of whom have not been outside in over a year, be allowed out for a walk or a socially distanced visit to a cafe or pub garden? I'm asking this on behalf of my 94-year-old grandmother. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. And I think that, uh, Catherine, you, you, you speak on behalf of millions who, uh, who want to, to, to see uh, more flexibility for uh, visiting uh, elderly relatives in, in care homes and, and or allowing them to do more. And I know it's been a very, very tough time uh, for, for those in, in care homes. You remember uh, how 
uh, hard our care homes were hit by that first wave of the of the pandemic. We've had to do everything we can uh, possibly to protect them. Uh, what we're doing from uh, from Monday, the April the 12th, as I said just now, is we're allowing uh, more people to visit elderly relatives uh, in care homes, let, let, uh, going up from from one to two. And Catherine, we're doing a review uh, right now on the specific. Um, request that you, you make, and I'm sure on behalf of, of many others, to try to get that going uh, in, a, in a reasonable and uh, a safe way. But you'll, you'll hear a bit more about that, Catherine, uh, later on uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few days. Uh, can we go to, to Matthew from Norwich? As more adults become protected due to the speedy vaccine rollout, is there a risk that COVID-19 could mutate and affect children more? If so, are scientists looking at a vaccine for children also? Uh, excellent question from Matthew, but I think I'm going to ask uh, Chris and Pat, or Patrick to... Yeah, I'm happy to go yeah, that. Um, yeah. Well, I think there's, there's, there's no evidence that, there's, that the virus is going to mutate specifically to affect children. What may happen as more and more people become immune to the virus through vaccination is that the virus will try and get round that and to try to escape the vaccine. That's a normal process that viruses do, so we'd expect that over time, which is why over time it may be necessary to update the vaccines maybe every year, every couple of years, it'll be necessary to have a slightly different vaccine um, for certain vulnerable groups. So that's what we'd expect to change. In terms of vaccines for children, that is being looked at. It'd be the same vaccines. The Pfizer uh, study read out um, last week that they're, they're looking at this in, in, in children. And so I expect to see more trials of vaccines in children over the next few months. Uh, uh, um, and but it'll be the same vaccines. Could I just add one point on this, which is one of the uh, few um, good things about this uh, epidemic, and there are almost none, uh, is that children are relatively unaffected. But for that reason, you'd want to be absolutely confident that a vaccine was highly safe because children are at relatively low risk, and therefore you want to be confident that uh, the vaccine is incredibly safe if you're using it in children. Uh, in older adults, of course, the risk of COVID is incredibly high, so that the risk ratios uh, look different. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks, you, Matthew. Ian Watson, BBC. Uh, happy Easter, Prime Minister. Obviously, some good news today. But uh, on vaccine passports, they seem to have achieved the remarkable political feat of uniting a former Labour leader and a former Conservative leader against them. About 40 of your own MPs regard them as divisive. So first of all, if they are to be introduced, can you guarantee there'd be a vote in Parliament on this issue? And secondly, would you like to take this opportunity to reassure the sceptics that while they could be useful for big events, people will not need to take a certificate to the local pub no. to gain entry? And very briefly, if I can ask this too, on your review documents, they're sounding pretty pessimistic about foreign travel going ahead in May. When do you think you'll be able to tell us that people can book a foreign holiday? Uh, Ian, thank you very much, and uh, uh, lots of very good uh, points there. First of all, on uh, COVID status certification, as we as we prefer to to call it, uh, I think the most important thing to say uh, to everybody listening and, and watching is that uh, there is absolutely no. Uh, question of people being asked to produce uh, certification or uh, COVID status uh, report when they go to the, uh, to the, to the shops or uh, to the pub garden uh, or to the hairdressers or, or whatever in, uh, on Monday. So, uh, and indeed, uh, we're not planning uh, that for step three either. Uh, May the 17th, as you know, uh, we're hoping to go for uh, the opening up of, uh, of indoor hospitality uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, we're not planning for anything of that kind at, the, at that stage. But I think what is certainly true is that the idea of um, uh, vaccination status being useful for international travel uh, is, is something that all countries are, are looking at. I do think that's going to be part of, our, uh, of, of the way people deal with it. We need to think about that. But uh, there are basically three ingredients to uh, your, your COVID certification or three ways that you can give reassurance to, uh, to others if you go to, uh, to a, a big mass event and, uh, or, 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 or uh, ways you can, that people can be assured that the people in the room uh, don't uh, have the risk of spreading COVID. And the number one is your, your immunity. Uh, so if you've had it, if you had the virus before in the last, or certainly in the last six months, you'll have uh, the antibodies. Number two 
uh, obviously is, is, is vaccination status. Uh, but number three is, is testing. And testing really is valuable. I've been talking about this for a long time, but uh, the NHS, as you know, is now offering uh, free uh, lateral flow tests. So I do think that they are uh, for, for asymptomatic uh, people as as well. I do think that they're uh, they're 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 an important part of of the way forward. But I want to stress that there are uh, complicated uh, ethical and practical issues, as I think I said last time, uh, raised by the idea of COVID uh, status certification. Because after uh, for vaccination, uh, using vaccination alone, just because after all, many people. Um, will be for one reason or another uh, unable to to get a vaccine for for medical reasons, for instance, or or, or perhaps because they're pregnant or, or whatever. So you've got to be very careful in how you handle this and and don't uh, start a system that's that's uh, discriminatory. Um, but obviously we're looking at it. Uh, we want to be going ahead in the next uh, a few weeks with uh, some test events, some pilot events, which which you can see in the. Uh, in the in the the roadmap that we've uh, that we've laid out, and uh, big events like you know getting 20,000 people into into Wembley on uh, on May the 15th, uh, that kind of thing, you know, getting people back into uh, a theatre, uh, that will unquestionably involve uh, testing uh, uh, to to allow the the audience uh, to really to participate in, in in the numbers that that people want. As for um, a, uh, a vote on the on the issue. Uh, well, I think that's we're, we're taking too many fences at once. First of all, we need to to, to work out exactly what the proposal uh, might be. Uh, but certainly, if there's something to put to, to Parliament, I, I've no doubt that we'll be doing that. But I want to stress again that that is not going to happen uh, in step two, uh, April the 12th, or, or step three, uh, May the, the 17th. And I hope that that helps. And uh, sorry, um, you, you also asked about aviation and international travel. And there, this is obviously we're hopeful uh, that we can get going, but uh, on, on from May the 17th, we're hopeful. Um, but I do not wish to give hostages to fortune or uh, to underestimate the difficulties that we're seeing in some of the destination countries that people might want to, to go to. Uh, we don't want to see the virus being re-imported into this country uh, from abroad. Uh, plainly, there is a surge in other parts of the of the world, and we have to be to be mindful of that, and we have to be to be realistic. So, what we're going to do, the, the Global uh, Travel Task Force is going to report uh, later on uh, this week. Uh, we will then be setting out uh, well before May the 17th what we think uh, is is reasonable. So, I, I, I wish I could I could give you more. Uh, on that, Ian, I know that people watching will want to know uh, exactly what they can do from uh, from May the 17th. But you know, we're not there yet. As soon as we have solid information, uh, more solid uh, data, uh, we'll let you know. But uh, but that's where we are for the time being. I think that's. Uh, that I think think I, either of you guys need to address those points. Thank you very much, Ian. Let's go to to, to Shehab Khan of ITV. Prime Minister, I appreciate the uh, plan to introduce COVID passports isn't coming in in the next few steps, but to expand on that idea, do you think it's fair to expect people to show a certificate to do something that was once a normal activity? And what support will you provide businesses who will have to enforce it? And are you expecting them to eventually turn people away who don't have a certificate? And a second question, if I may, uh, research that was published in the British Medical Journal a few weeks ago found that adherence to test, trace and isolate was low. You're now set to roll out this new mass testing scheme where you can get two rapid tests a week. How much compliance do you need for that to actually work? And how can you be confident that it will work, given that compliance levels of test, trace and isolate were so low? Well, she have actually, well, first of all, on uh, your question about um, uh, COVID status and certification, and I really direct you to what I said just now to, to Ian. You're taking too many fences at once. Uh, we're, we're, Stages two and three don't involve uh, anything of the kind. When we have uh, proposals, we'll be, uh, we'll be setting them out. Uh, and on um, uh, your point about test rates and isolate, uh, actually, I think that um, testing has been a massive advantage to this country. Our ability to conduct 
I think 112 million tests I, was the last number I saw. Um, uh, you know, a huge proportion of the population already been tested. That's one of the reasons she had that we've been able to follow the path of, of the disease to isolate its genomic sequence in the way uh, that Chris was uh, was explaining uh, just now. That's why we, we know so much about the variants in this country uh, that we that we face. Uh, so it's been of, of massive use to us in, in fighting the disease. And I, I think that lateral flow testing will be of great advantage to us all as we as we go forward. I mean, uh, I do lateral flow tests before I go out on a on a visit uh, to test uh, whether or not I might conceive it would be uh, in infectious. Uh, I think it's a, it's a sensible thing to do. The NHS is now offering, uh, as I say, these free tests, uh, and I think people uh, should, should use them. No? Well, te te I mean, lateral flow tests uh, are, are effective at picking up people who are infectious. They're not 100% effective, so a, a negative doesn't mean you absolutely haven't got it, but a positive that is useful to identify those people who then need to isolate, and you're right that testing alone isn't what matters. It matters if you're positive, and it's a true positive, you isolate. And lateral flow tests are definitely part of a, a, a way of trying to pick up more people who otherwise wouldn't be picked up. Thank you. Uh, Beth Rigby, Sky. Thank you. Prime Minister, on February the 22nd, when you announced your roadmap, you said the vaccination programme would create a shield around the entire population and put us on a one-way road to freedom. But now, after June the 21st, it looks like you're asking us to have twice weekly testing, and it's likely that we'll have to carry around some form of COVID certification. Is that your vision now for what freedom looks like for all of us, and how long are we going to actually have to live like this? And to Professor Whitty, Chile has one of the world's fastest vaccination rates, but it's also just had to close its borders to slow the spread of COVID and stop the influx of new variants from abroad. Is there anything we can learn from the Chile experience? And are there any implications of it on our own summer holidays? Beth, first of all, I, 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 Chris, I'm sure will want to answer the question about, uh, about Chile. But, but on the, um, you know, the, the vision for the for the future and what the world will be like after June the 21st. I think a great deal depends on the continuing success of the vaccine rollout and us continuing to satisfy the, the, the full tests. And um, if things continue to go well, uh, I do think that uh, for many people in many ways, uh, life will uh, begin to get back to uh, you know at least some semblance of, of normality. But uh, you know we're still some way off there. We've got to be guided by the data uh, and we've got to make sure that we, we follow the, the roadmap. That's the way to get there. I, and I think that a world in which we continue to have um, testing uh, is, is not going to be uh, too onerous. Um, uh, but, you, you know, you're, we're, you're slightly putting the cart before uh, the horse. We need to make sure we get through um, uh, stage two right. We get through the April the 12th openings, uh, get through the May the 17th openings uh, all right if we can. And then June the, June the 21st, uh, we finally open up a lot of things that we couldn't open up uh, last year. Uh, I think the, things will feel really very different for the first time in a, in a, in a long time. Um, but we've got to be pretty cautious uh, to get there. I think we're still on target. I want to repeat one key thing I, I, I said earlier on. There's nothing in the data that I can see today that would cause us to deviate from the roadmap as things stand. Uh, on the question you asked me, um, I mean, Chile provides one uh, important example. I think the, the other extreme, uh, Israel provides another. Two countries that have got very extensive vaccination. Uh, in Israel, the rates have really gone down and are staying down for the moment. And I think it's really important we now watch that. Uh, in Chile, as you say, significant, uh, remarkable effort by the Chilean uh, people to vaccinate, to vaccinate at a high level, uh, which is excellent. Uh, but, the, but they have not had quite the same effect now. Is this due to uh, the vaccines used? Is this due to the timing of when things have actually been rolled out? Uh, is it due to particular interactions with other variants? 
we don't yet know. And I think your, the implication of your question, which is we absolutely need to learn from those uh, countries that are, uh, are ahead of us in terms of, or alongside us, uh, in terms of uh, vaccine rollout. Uh, and those are two of the key ones, but there are others. Uh, and um, you know, as we get more data, I think the, the information from other countries, as well as the information from our own epidemiology, will tell us actually you know, how much can we gradually lower our guard. But this is the reason we want to do things in a steady way, because the assumption that just you vaccinate lots of people and the problem goes away, I think Chile is quite a good uh, kind of corrective to that. This is something we've got to uh, take steadily. Thanks very much. Uh, Jane Merrick, the eye. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, can I just ask a factual question, which is what about children in relation to vaccine um, passports? Will they be required to have these certificates? And secondly, Prime Minister, it's a year to the day since you were admitted to hospital with coronavirus. Did you imagine back then that we would still be in the pandemic one year on? And if I could also ask that of Professor Whitty and Sir Patrick. First of all, on the, the, the vaccine uh, passport question, you know, that, again, Jane, you're slightly uh, taking your, your fences all, all at once. We're, we're, we're a way off. Um, uh, implementing or enacting any anything of the kind for anybody, let alone uh, let alone children, and I and I've spelt out the you know the, the the ways in which we might think of doing that, but it's not for steps uh, two and three uh, in any event. And I suppose a, a year a year on, uh, I I'm actually filled with amazement that science has produced so many vaccines. That's the thing. I I, I you know I remember having this conversation. Uh, with Patrick and Chris many times, and we thought, and, and I was a great believer, and still am, in the virtues of uh, of testing as a way through, because I could see this thing would keep going and keep going for a for a long time. But I never thought that we would get so many workable uh, vaccines in such a, a short order. When you consider we haven't got one, you know, we haven't got vaccines against SARS or or, or AIDS or, or whatever. And uh, so I think that's that's the most stunning thing about the about the last year. I mean, I, I fairly consistently from the beginning, uh, as did most scientists, said now this is widespread, it's going to stay with us for a very long time. And I don't think there's any surprise that it is still with us now, nor is this going to magically disappear over the next few months. This, this virus will be with us for the uh, foreseeable future. But as the Prime Minister just said, uh, science is over time going to de-risk it and it is doing so very substantially with the vaccines. I think the thing which has surprised me, if anything, is the speed with which we've got the number of vaccines we have rather than the fact we've still got a, a, uh, a virus now. But we will have significant problems with COVID for the foreseeable future and I don't think we should pretend otherwise. Yeah. That, and I think right. exactly the same. I, mean, I think before the first wave hit us, we were worried that there would be a second wave and a third wave after it. That seemed likely. And unfortunately, that's been borne out across the world. And um, uh, I echo what the others have said, that the, the miracle in this is, is to end up with such effective vaccines so quickly. Really a remarkable um, scientific triumph. Thanks. Or uh, Mesa Hall Express. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Um, if I could ask the scientists, um, the government do review document today doesn't give much away about when social distancing measures uh, might might start to disappear. Can you update us at all on uh, when people who have been vaccinated will be able to safely hug their friends and family? And um, Prime Minister, some people have said that um, COVID status certification certificates or passports or whatever you want to call them are, are like ID cards. They're un-British. Are they wrong? Um, you guys first, I think. Um, on the rollout of, of vaccines and the effects of that, I mean, clearly the roadmap lays out the steps and the next step in terms of being able to see people indoors would be 17th of May if the data are in the right direction. And that's true for people who are vaccinated or unvaccinated. It's true right the way across the community. So that doesn't change. And what also doesn't change is that in that five week period, it's going to be necessary to look at data and we won't be able to do that until week four. So we won't really know what the impact is and we don't know what the impact is yet of the changes on the 29th of March. So I think there's a lot to do following, you know, the opening up of step two, which looks a very reasonable thing to do. And all the modelling suggests step two on its own shouldn't have a big impact. 
We need to watch that, measure it, and see it after week four. And I think only when we get through these steps can we then start looking at uh, some of the other, other aspects as well. And social distancing, I mean, I mean, I think one needs to sort of understand what that might mean longer term. And it probably means things like hand hygiene, things like the fact that people will take time off if they get ill, stay at home, rather than going into work. So taking time to take yourself out, testing to know whether you've got it or not. Those sorts of things, I think, are likely to be important baseline measures going forward. If I could just add one thing to this, uh, which is, um, as you go through the vaccination programme, the protection to you steadily increases, first from the first vaccine, then from the booster vaccine increases your protection, and I hope your uh, newspaper will encourage your readers to get their second vaccine. It's absolutely essential. Then the fact that people who are around you, you actually physically meet, have had their, had their first and then their second vaccine, that provides another layer of protection around you. And then finally, the fact that vaccines across a wide part of the population keep the rates down, so the probability is low. But remember, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the number of people who have actually got uh, the virus at the moment is about one in 370. So uh, we, we really want to get those rates down further uh, before uh, we start to feel that uh, the, the society as a whole has got quite a low level of COVID. Yeah, Mace, I mean, I think the, the principle of requiring uh, some people to uh, have a certificate to prove that they're not uh, passing on a disease like surgeons who uh, have to show that they're vaccinated against hep B or, or whatever. That's, that's, that's a, that can be a, a sensible one. But I want to stress that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're some way off finalising any plans for, uh, for COVID certification in the, in the UK. Uh, the crucial thing is for everybody to get out and, and get, their, uh, get their, their vaccination when they get your vaccination, when you're, you're asked to, to come forward. And uh, as Chris says, get your, your second dose when you're asked to, to come forward. The, the, the uptake at the moment is fantastic. And that's, that's very, very important that it, that, uh, it should continue. I and mean, I think we've, we're seeing something like 99.75% uh, uptake in the, uh, for, for the second doses, which is, which is terrific. And that's what we want to see. Uh, last question, Stefan Boscher, uh, City AM. Thank you, Prime Minister. You said earlier that it was too early to give a date for the resumption of international travel, but can you commit to give the aviation sector at least three to four weeks notice of when this date will be to ensure that they have some sort of clarity and certainty going forward? And secondly, if I may, London has been disproportionately affected by the economic impacts of COVID. The unemployment rate here is now 2% higher than the rest of the country. And yet your government hasn't given TfL a long-term funding settlement the aviation and sector in Heathrow Airport don't seem to have any idea about when they can start again. And there doesn't appear to be any plans to give central London targeted economic support, despite being the nation's most important economic hub. As a former mayor of London, why haven't you done more to safeguard the capital's long-term future? Uh, th thanks uh, very much, Stefan. On the a aviation issue, we're, we're going to give as uh, much notice as we possibly can. Uh, we're going to want to get the country flying again. We continue to support uh, the aviation uh, industry in all in all kinds of ways, but uh, the best thing for them is to is to get flying, and that's uh, that's absolutely critical. I also uh, happen to think that the London economy is capable of bouncing back uh, very strongly, and the way to do that uh, is to get uh, people back into the centre, get the shops open again, get people moving again into the get the agglomeration effects of uh, of, a, of a gigantic metropolis uh, like London working again. But that requires people uh, to be safe, it requires people to be confident, and it requires uh, the, the vaccine rollout to continue to be uh, successful until we get to, to steps uh, three and four. And then I think you really will see a big change in uh, the way uh, we live our lives. Now, I don't think that's necessarily going to come in a rush. I think people will take time. I think a lot of people have learned to uh, work more from home. Uh, during the pandemic, it, but uh, my experience is, is when I was running uh, TfL uh, is that uh, actually there's a kind of paradox of remote communication, which I mentioned before. The more people uh, spend time uh, trying to communicate by Zoom uh, and uh, on all sorts of remote electronic communication, the more they hunger and thirst actually for direct uh, contact with the, the people that they need to, 
to talk to you. So I think that will all come back. It may take a while, Stefan, for it to, to come back. But I've absolutely no doubt that London will, will bounce back very strongly, particularly once we get the, uh, the life going again in uh, the artistic, the cultural uh, sector, the, the theatres, uh, all the rest of that. Once that just starts going again, as, and, and you can see from the roadmap uh, how that can happen, I think there'll be a, r a really big change in, in London. As for the finances of TfL, uh, I must respectfully remind you that I left them in robust uh, good uh, order. And uh, it, it is not uh, through any fault of, uh, of, of my own that the, the current uh, Labour mayor decided to blow them on an irresponsible fares policy. Uh, we're doing our best to, uh, to help him out and will continue uh, to do so. But uh, I'm afraid uh, you've got to look at some of the, some of the decisions uh, that were taken by the, the current uh, Labour mayor as well. I, I, I hesitate to make a, uh, a, a point like that, but since you, since you rightly draw attention to um, uh, the fact that I'm a proud former mayor of London, uh, I do think we could, uh, we could look at the way TfL has been run. That doesn't mean we aren't going to continue to support. Of course we are, but uh, we need to have some, uh, some responsibility uh, from the mayor as well. And there was, a, I'm afraid, a black hole in TfL's finances even before COVID began, as I'm sure you will, uh, you will recollect and, and your readers uh, will recollect. Okay, everybody, well, on that, on that slightly, uh, slightly um, London-centric note, we're going, to, we're going to end, but uh, there you go. The, the, the roadmap uh, continues to uh, uh, be one that we are sticking to like glue. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, all the data that I can see uh, suggests to me that uh, we have no reason uh, to deviate from it. We're going to uh, get to step uh, two on April the 12th. And uh, at the moment, uh, things st still seem set fair for, for May the 17th, but we will keep everything constantly under review. Thank you all very much.